ballet and the 4th of July. What could be better? May the words that are heard be thine and not mine. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As a matter of the heart, love is not easily defined. In many ways, immeasurable, at least by human senses, yet quantifiable in sensuality. Even with that being said, we many times feel confident that we know exactly what love is. It reminds me of Forrest Gump's dialogue with Jenny. Why don't you love me, Jenny? I know what love is, even though I'm not a smart man. You see, even Forrest knows. Ask someone how they know that they are experiencing true love and listen to them count the ways. So often what they will describe will be esoterics that could apply to anyone with whom they have acquaintance or relationship. The difference, I guess, is the level or the depth of that emotion. It hinges, hinges on our feelings or how they make us feel. Another nebulous concept, hard to interpret, but so definitely held. Shakespeare referred to it as a matter of faith. Again, hard to elucidate that term, at least not precisely. Listen to Shakespeare's 141st sonnet. In faith I do not love thee with mine eyes, for they in thee a thousand eras note, but tis my heart that loves what they despise, who in despite of you is pleased to dote. Nor are mine ears with thy tongue's tune delighted, nor tender feeling to base touches prone, nor taste nor smell desire to be invited, to any sensual feast with thee alone. But my five wits nor my five senses can dissuade one foolish heart from serving thee, who leaves unswayed the likeness of a man, thy proud heart slave and vassal wretch to be. Only my plague, thus far I count my gain that she that makes me yearn awards me pain. The emotion in his words so evident, this intangible of faith that he describes is one of the heart. Paul employs faith as a selling point in our New Testament reading. It is an F and B, or feature and benefit of his pitch to the Corinthians concerning a collection that he desires for the church at Rome. Let me explain. At this point in his ministry, Paul had set his sights on Spain, but was aware of a need in the church at Rome. The Corinthians were a wealthy community, so Paul reached out to them for help. However, very much like the church of today, Money matters can be kind of tricky. The Corinthians weren't buying the idea. I mean, this advancing the kingdom, loving one another, sharing gladly what God has blessed us with so extensively stuff, well, that's all well and good, but don't bother asking us for any money. I mean, lordship only goes so far after all. Sort of sounds familiar. Well, Paul sends envoys for the collection twice, and they are not successful. If Corinth was giving their precious money, then Paul himself would have to come collect it. So he postpones his mission work to Spain just to appease them. He goes, collects the money, and heads to Rome, where he is soon thereafter arrested and then soon thereafter executed by Nero. He never reached Spain. 
Paul admonished them to be of more faith. What if they would have been more faithful? I wonder if they ever connected the dots that their self-righteous justification and basic high-maintenance ways were indirectly the measure of Paul's death. Our greatest missionary lost because of a lack of faith. Well, Christ dovetails this concept of faith in our Gospel reading in Mark. But first, another sidebar. Mark's account is believed to be the oldest of the Gospels and was a source for at least the other two synoptics. Mark is divided into distinct sections or narratives. One refers to his Galilean ministry. Another is prominently known as the road to Jerusalem. And a third, in which we find Jesus today, pertains to His ministry and teachings around the sea. Within the three tracks, a pattern of revealing and concealing is consistent. Jesus grants a revelation, but then is selective with whom He will give explanation. One theory concerning this stylistic approach is that the audience was either unable or unwilling to hear due to their faith. Hold on to that thought. Back to the story. Remember, last week, Jesus and the disciples, they set off across the Sea of Galilee to escape the crowds. There they encounter a storm, and when they arrive on the other side, they encounter more crowds. The account then tells of two different miracles and two very different faiths. A woman is suffering with menstrual hemorrhaging. She's been suffering with it for 12 years. Her condition would have been considered unclean due to ecclesiastical law, and thus she would have been quarantined, forbidden from being in society, forbidden from being in public or large crowds. So con courageously and against that, she inconspicuously attempts an approach to Jesus in hopes that merely touching His robe would be enough. Believing that that would be enough to free her of her 12-year bondage and misery. Well, prior to the encounter, Jesus had, approached, had been approached by a local church official requesting that He come and heal His daughter. Now, I felt His anguish, for she was a similar age to Lily. She was about 12. I'll let you make the connection. Jesus is on His way to see the young girl when He senses His healing energy flow from Him suddenly. Someone had touched His robe. Now thousands were touching Him. A mob all wanting something from Him. But only one was healed that, we, healed that we learn of. He turns and inquires as to who touched him and frightened. She confesses. I've broken ecclesiastical law, Jesus. I touched you. What will be my punishment? I won't be able to accompany you over to the church leader's home. I'm not welcome there. I haven't been welcome there for 12 years. In the midst of all that chaos, with the weight of their breath bearing down on them, being pressed to hurry to the person of status' home, everyone anxious, you know, to see the show, to see a miracle, can't wait to put it on Facebook or Instagram, Jesus stopped felt her, and she was healed. Her faith was the key instrument. That was the conduit for the grace. Well, a few short moments later, at the synagogue leader's home, Jesus is told that He is too late and is mocked when suggested otherwise. 
they were all dismissed and Jesus happened again. Why were some granted revelation while it was concealed from others? Did Jesus play favorites? Or was it a matter of faith? The ones who were sincere, they received. You know, the we're just here to be amazed so Jesus could prove Himself Messiah group. The ones, you know, the religious, religious types who really didn't believe but needed something from Jesus. The same ones who would betray Him a short while later. You know, that group. Their faiths were not sincere. The word pistos is faith in the Greek. It is translated as credence, religious conviction, truth in itself, assurance, belief, fidelity. But look what happens when you add the prefix oligo. Oligos in the Greek means of small amount. So oligopistos changes the word entirely. It changes to incredulous which means disbelieving, skeptical, distrustful, suspicious, doubtful, dubious, cynical, and unconvinced. It's faith that is little. Their faith was too small. Dear ones, this only works when you are all in. If you if your idea of faith in Christ is somehow just riding the fence, then you will never get it. To have the power and joy and fulfillment you, that you desire in your life, to receive a revelation, you have to risk it all. Just like the woman with the hemorrhage or have no other options like the little girl who was dead otherwise. Paul wanted the Corinthians to stop being so self-absorbed and sell out to something bigger. It ultimately costed Paul everything. Oh, but their harvest is full for all who will have faith. Peace to and God, God responds faithfully in return. Lamentations underscores the point with the words borrowed by Thomas Chilsom, Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord my Father. There is no shadow of changing with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness. Lord, unto me.